Hello everyone, and welcome back to Inking Out Loud. I'm your host, as usual, Rob Santos, and I'm joined by my co-host, Drew McCaffrey. How's it going, everybody? And joining us again today is his wife, Lauren McCaffrey. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming back, Lauren. And it's time to dive into book nine of The Wheel of Time, Winter's Heart. Drew, take it away, my man, with a recap. All right, so we pick up right away in uh, Tarvalon, where the Black Aja hunters are questioning Talin after she refused to re-swear the Three Oaths and uh, basically figure out that she is Black Aja. And then we jump to Camelin, where Elaine and Avienda become first sisters, officially, through the Aiel ceremony. Yeah, they do. And then we are off to Perrin, uh, where he has been staying up and out, waiting for Fayil to return, and she does not. He nearly freezes to death. He's taken back to the camp to Bear Lane's tent, where she kind of keeps him uh, to convalesce, and also to imply slash spread rumors that Perrin may or may not have slept with her. And Perrin deals with the fallout of that while also trying to organize his thoughts and plan on how to find Fael. And then we go back to Elaine in Camelin, where uh, she's, you know, arrived and she's sort of solidifying her power and laying the plans to make her bid for the throne during this kind of succession uncertainty in, in Andor. She is nearly assassinated after she's sort of drugged with tea and she is saved by uh uh Melar slash mm. David Hanlon. Yeah. And yeah, uh, um and we find out that there are other dark friends afoot, you know, Millie Skane and the Black Aja are all in Camelin and planning with David Hanlon, you know, to Yeah, to to mess mess things up there. Um <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Rand shows up. He is there to get Nynaeve and uh, uh, take her away from Elaine so that they can go cleanse the male half of the true power, uh, true source, excuse me. Um, wow, that's a <laughs> very, very different thing. Um, uh, but before Rand can leave, Elaine bonds him in a triple bonding with Avienda and Min, and then Elaine and Rand sleep together. Elaine gets pregnant. Uh, meanwhile, back in Kyrian, Alana has been, like, knocked out because of this new bond that Rand has, and Cadswain is trying to sort of rally the troops in Kyrian, where there's a lot of uncertainty because Rand has disappeared in the aftermath of the Renegade Ashraman attack. And then we go to Ebudar, where Tuan arrives. And uh, Matt is hanging out with Eludra, and she gives him a riddle about Bell Founders. Matt is then on his way back to the palace, attacked by the Golom and saved by Noal, who decides to hang around. Matt returns to the palace. The dice stop when he meets Tuan, and he has no idea why. And Matt begins uh, planning his escape from Mebudar with uh, Satal Anand, and that's where we left off. Yeah, yeah, lots, lots happening now. Uh, in book nine, a lot of really big things happening, and the pace is actually picking up quite a bit, especially after Path of Daggers. At least for me, I know you had a lot to to glow about in that book, Drew. But myself, <laughs> I kind of felt like it dragged a little bit, despite the fact that it was significantly shorter. But I want to dive right into the style discussion to start off with because I'm really uh, I don't have a whole lot to say, but I'm excited to say what I do want to say. And that first off is I want to ask how cool these epigraphs are getting at the beginnings of these books. Like, oh, yeah, this one just gave me chills. I love it. For winter's heart shall ride a black horse and the name of it is death. Like, is it just me or is this getting like downright biblical? Like, not just obviously in subject. That's clear. But like just in cadence and style, it's so badass. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I, I really do. <laughs> He's got a knack for them. That's for sure. Um, and of course, with the context that we currently have going forward, it's just oh, it's just all the much all the cooler for it for sure um but Di oh yeah knowing about morden right, and, you right. Know, and how how that's a reference to him and uh yeah something that and there's go ahead there's something in the like the tone of the beginning of this book with the snow storms everywhere you know mm -hmm. coming down and 
that makes this feel a lot darker just from the get go. It, it you know gloomier and and colder, like yeah, not literally but figuratively as well. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. <laughs> Um, but going forward straight into the prologue, I will say Jordan almost lost me in this prologue. Like, it's just so many, and I bitched about this previously, but these Aes Sedai names that I don't care about, I didn't care, still don't care, just, uh, I wrote down, I just want to put a gun in my mouth at that point. Um, mm. but <laughs> he saved it, though, by this incredible scene that followed, though, with Elaine and Avienda finally becoming first sisters. <laughs> That was oh, a man. powerful bit of writing. What's up? What are you talking about? Like, C.A. and Pavard? Yeah, I and... love C.A. I didn't yeah. care for that at all. I was just <laughs> like, nah. I don't know. I was getting bored with it. Maybe it's because I was really tired at work and I was kind of nodding off as I was listening to it. But it was, I don't know. I was kind of bored. I, I, I really jumped on board once we got to the Elaine and Avienda scene where they actually finally adopted one another as first sisters. That's what really got the ball rolling for me. But I, go ahead. Back up your... Uh, Excitement so about seeing and co. We we finally finally get a handle on the Black Aja, and we have confirmation, and we have possibly. I mean, for the first read, you're like, "Ooh, we got him, we got him." She's gonna know who the other members are, and we're gonna start to unravel this. <laughs> you think? I don't know. I, I, See, that's why point, it's exciting. At this point, I feel like we already knew so many black sisters for who they were that it kind of lost its impact. Sorry, uh, continue though. Uh, Drew, were you going to say something there? I mean, I I enjoy it uh, for that kind of Aes Sedai politicking here. I enjoy seeing okay. the dynamics among right. the different sitters. Uh, I like Cian a lot because she's just so genuine. Um, and I also like seeing one of the black out job get her comeuppance. I mean, Talene I mean, is having a bad day. You know, finally, <laughs> well, yeah, it with was, the chair of remorse and like, yeah. oh, I keep forgetting about the chair of remorse. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, um, but yeah, I still want to glow about the scene where where Elaine and Avienda adopted one another, though, as first sisters like that ceremony was awesome. It felt real. It felt heartfelt. You know, that fascinating use of the one power and knowing what we know now about what it inspires in Lane, like in Lane. Listen to me in Elaine. Uh, for later it's just i totally forgot this scene was coming and it was just so much more enjoyable for it i thought it was incredible i loved that scene well i love her getting pulled out right <laughs> and, unexpectedly you know, like of... being yeah 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 it's it's a bit ridiculous and it's at the worst time and they planned it but yeah. also the fact that the aiel have these kind of weaves that they have figured out for themselves that, yeah right that nobody exactly. knew of previously you know that the tower it's it's not quite the same as the water bond not in any way well ugh, that's well, debatable it definitely but, gave elaine a lot of inspiration for that triple water bond later because i think during that scene she actually mentioned uh internally that she had actually get, been given inspiration from this aiel ceremony for that triple water bond yeah yeah I'm, uh yes that is correct at the end yeah but i love how they they really are bonded together, like the character development between them. Yeah, it was really, great. It was so cool. The fact that the they were worst. Like born together, that was like, ah, that was kind of heartfelt. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, a little, a little mm, awkward. <laughs> In some ways. But I mean, it has to, to be. It. Right. it has to be. <laughs> yeah, I do. Lo I do. I love how much they learned about one another in that scene and all the questions that they were asked, the confessions they had for one another about what they envied in the other, what they hated about the other. Like it was, it was just, I don't know. It's, it's scenes like this that really give me the appreciation for the Aiel way of life and the Aiel ceremony. I just love them as a people. They're so fascinating to read and there's so much to be had out of just everything that they do. I love it. It's, it's really, really cool. I agree. It makes me wonder like, what else have we not, seen out of them weaves right. wise you know what else have they figured out that's a good point that actually. the i you know the ice and i are just way too proud to yeah. investigate i mean that's not even talking about dreamwalking right exactly. like the ideal wise ones are so much more advanced than the ice and in those areas too and then of course we see uh the ice and i uh hubris in the the wind finders and the the sea folk and exactly what like the the sea folk like the Yoth and Mira channelers can do themselves with working with weather and stuff like that. It's like a it's a big recurring theme, of course, throughout the Wheel of Time series, like the ignorance of the Aes Sedai and how how highly they hold themselves and 
kind of teaching them a little bit of humility if, because they need it. But well, not I feel like Go ahead, pride sorry. is the downfall is, is a theme of so many characters in this book. Mm-hmm. You yep. know? Speaking I of characters, should we dive into our character discussion? Do we have anything to say about this incredible prologue? Uh, I have one more thing to say about the prologue. Take it away, dude. Hi, Andral. Oh, yes. And this is something I did not expect to come. I thought, honestly, and I don't know why I thought this. It's a confession I have, of course. Um, I, I forgot Andral already existed. I thought Andral was a Sanderson creation. Yep. He was, uh, as I understand it, Brandon basically told Harriet, like, look, I need to make a character to make this whole Black Tower thing work. Right. And she told him to pick an Ashaman. Yeah. Who had already, you know, been written in and he was, run He was with mentioned him. by last name, I think, only, right? Yes. He was uh, he's, as Genhal. Uh, yeah. Uh, or, no, I thought it was just Andral. He was, I definitely heard Genhold. I definitely heard. You that. heard Genhold. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe you're right. Um, it might have been, I know he might have been mentioned by first name somewhere else before that, and I just didn't hear it or pick up on it. You, you, you might be right. It's been a couple of weeks since I read the prologue. Okay. So, uh, but <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but yeah, I, it, this is the first time he was mentioned, and I think the only time he's mentioned until uh, Towers of you know, Brandon takes over. I think Towers of Midnight. It wasn't Gathering Storm that he was mentioned first, right? Uh, I don't think he was in Gathering Storm. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So I, st- I'm, I'm, I have a lot to say about our characters here. Definitely, I'm ready to dive into those unless we have anything else before we do so. No, let's uh, let's dive into Perrin because this is Ooh, okay. Um, well. I mean, it's where the book really starts, and I think this is the portion of this book that uh, readers have the hardest time with. Yeah. When you see people complaining about how Winter's Heart is slow online, it's usually complaining about the Perrin and Fael storylines. Okay, okay. Um, and and while I won't, I can't really say it's slow in this part of this book. Uh, it is annoying because so much of Perrin's chapters in this is him being ineffective and him being you know robbed of agency. He can't do anything. He feels so helpless losing Fael and then watching these rumors abound about, you know, Bear Lane, where, like, it's frustrating for Perrin and it's frustrating for us to be in Perrin's head because of that. I'm, you know? like Actually, before I continue with what I'm going to say, because I'm going to do some bitching about it, I still want to hear what Lauren thinks. Lauren, Perrin, the beginning of this book. I mean, it is frustrating, but I definitely see where... Robert Jordan was using this as character development time. So some of it has got to be necessary, uh, even though it's frustrating. And and I think it's meant to be in a way, but maybe it goes on a little long. Okay, okay. (laughs) Um, So for my parent point here, I wrote, oh boy, where do I begin? Um, I'll admit that when I was planning to look for an appropriate beer for the podcast today, I was... Really hoping I was going to be able to find something along the lines of whiny bitch or something. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I wasn't actually able to make it to the grocery store today, so I had to settle for whatever we had lying uh, on hand here in the house here. More on that later during the final draft. But it's I, I do want to say it's, for me, still so, so hard to read Perrin already in this book. I mean, nothing matters anymore. Like, the world itself is dross. It's 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 beyond frustrating. And you mentioned his, his loss of agency, Drew. Um, yep. But I, 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 part of what frustrates the shit out of me is the fact that it seems to be willful loss or, like, willful uh, uh, relinquishing of agency because Fahil is taken and nothing matters to Perrin at all. And there's, like, there's this entire fiasco that's going on now with Bear Lane that you mentioned again. But I'm starting to think that the entire, oh, Perrin is being unfaithful, like the rumor that gets, that plagues him for the next three books. I honestly, I'm starting to think that was Jordan's attempt, perhaps, to just insert any reason he could for readers to maybe perhaps still sympathize with Perrin. I know. And and my basis for that, of course, for that criticism is just because I'm finding it's so hard to find that sympathy. Perrin is so single-minded and careless. He's really like an animal. And, and not in any cool epic fantasy way at the moment. He's, it's just tiresome to read. 
I mean, I I definitely don't think that was a mindset Robert Jordan had. I think Perrin has enough like sympathy for the fact that he just like had his wife kidnapped, you know. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. It, it's so it, like Fail, for example, she takes charge right away. She's immediately work like I don't know Fail at this point, and when we get into talking about Fail, perhaps we go there next because I have a few points to talk about with Fail, and a lot of well, it is good, but. Sorry, go ahead. I wasn't finished with Perrin yet, but I want to hear what you got to say. Well, so you're, to your point there, where you say Fayil immediately takes charge, that is to the point of Perrin's like conflict right now. It's it's his inability to be an effective leader, and this is what he's going to be struggling with for like this arc mm. of the series, you know. And so, of course, Robert Jordan's going to write his separated wife as a foil, where Fayil comes from royalty. She comes from this. Uh, you know, mentality of, uh, you know, kind of rulership. And Perrin, meanwhile, comes from, like, he's an apprentice. Like, that. that is, I think, something people gloss over so much is that Perrin's, like, single identifying characteristic at the beginning of this series, as far as role in society, is an apprentice. He serves. He learns. You know, and by the end of it, he has to be the ruler. He has to be the Lord. He has to be the leader. And that is a, a big mentality for him to break. So much of him is used to sitting back, taking things slowly, absorbing information and doing so from a passive subservient perspective that he has to become active and, you know, assertive. And that's hard for him. That's against his personality. But going against, like, for example, how Rand took to suddenly being granted leadership, and especially in much higher and more dramatic roles, you know, I think Rand handled it a lot better. He still wasn't perfect by no means, by no stretch. But of Rand wasn't word. an apprentice. Perhaps. I don't know. But the fact that, I guess, maybe, maybe drawing uh, juxtaposition forward with the kind of competent leader that I know Perrin becomes that could be making it a little more frustrating for me at the moment because it kind of just it it kind of feels out of character I mean no I shouldn't say it feels out of character he's always been 100% dedicated to Fayil but I just it's something about how he has that huge glaring easy obvious weak spot that stalls him for so long it's still frustrating for me to read because I just I don't know it, it's just frustrating I don't well, know yeah, how else I, to explain it. I don't think I don't think that's a, a problem. I think it's supposed to be frustrating to the reader because it's frustrating to Perrin. Yeah. And maybe if it was only frustrating for like one book, that would have been forgivable or easier to digest, but So well here's here's like the next step of my points on Perrin Go ahead. is that while I think there's an understandable frustration with Perrin in this book, I think it's totally unjustified how people extrapolate that to the entire book. Perrin oh, is only no, in five sure. chapters. Yeah. He's in five out of 35 chapters. Oh, hell He's yeah. barely in Winter's Heart. Like, I agreed 100%. Now, that does not yeah. drag the book as a whole for me <laughs> at all in any way. It's just Perrin. Yeah. Like, and, and not only that, but he's in like five of the first six chapters, and then we don't see him for the next 30 chapters. Mm -hmm. Like, this book is so much more than the plot line of death. And, and it frustrates me when I see people complaining about Winter's Heart because of the Perrin and Fayil storylines. I'm like, you realize that's, what, like 15% of this book is spent on them? There's 85% that's spent on way better things. When someone says that, it seems to me like they're sweeping under the rug a whole lot of really huge, momentous, kind of pivotal things for the Wheel of Time that are happening in rapid succession and even in the first half of this book. I mean, you should yeah. see my miscellaneous thoughts that I'm going to get to later. I have like 10 or 12 points, big things to point out that it's like, bam, I'm so glad I'm seeing this at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's it's fun. You know, there there's so, sure. there's so much yeah. in the first half of this book where, once again, we're continuing that thread, and maybe this goes back to the style points a bit, of uh, getting points of view from Dark Friends, from The Shadow. Yeah, yeah. Where we can see our heroes working toward their goals and stumbling. And then Robert Jordan sort of peels back the veil and lets us see maybe a little bit of why they're failing 
toward their goals because the forces of the shadow are working actively behind the scenes, you know, sort of lurking in the yep. shadows and, uh, and messing with them and messing with their plans. And, you know, and especially in this section where, where we see how many different parties of, of, uh, dark friends and forsaken spying on, you know, the machinations yeah. of, uh, you know, we, we have and, demand know, dread. We have, even. Yeah, uh, uh, so Falion and, and Asni, and we have Millie Skane and David Hanlon and Moradin and, like, you know, so many different entities, not all necessarily working together, but all working against the heroes. Yeah, for sure. Um, are we wrapped up on Perrin? Uh, is there anything that we want to say about Perrin? Lauren, do you have anything to add, perhaps? I mean, I was just going to ask if you wanted to get Fael out of the way. That's where I was going to go, go right next Perrin. after this, since we're already on Perrin. You're thinking exactly like I am. Fael? Sound good? <sighs> I mean, so she takes charge right away in the camps. Right. And she really pulls everybody together. Right. <laughs> but she's still a child. She's still Fael. Really? What What are your thoughts? Well, I actually really I kind of enjoyed reading Fael here, and and it might be my first time saying that ever. Um, I hadn't really before noticed how funny her narrative voice can be, particularly when she's in a bad mood. Um, I will say Jordan made me laugh outright a few times uh, in in this first scene of hers, despite obviously that like the dark nature of what's happening. Like Fael recognizes what's happening, and despite her greatest efforts you know actually hoping that bear lane escaped which you know just so parent could learn about masima and the shan chan of course and then hoping that she you know perhaps fell into a hole and broke her neck afterward or something like that i thought that was funny you know uh we had the image of magdin you know biting one of the shido and hanging on like a boarhound to yeah, destroy yeah. words that was that was a little amusing like even on a word by word basis growling around her mouth full of aiel like okay, it's it's <laughs> undoubtedly very dark what's happening to these women, but through Fayil's like temper and her spirits and her narrative voice, it's no wonder that she's actually kind of indirectly able to get them through this. Like I really liked Fayil so far in this part, but I I also have to stop and take a step back and wonder if it isn't because perhaps that she isn't in Perrin's presence to make things a living hell for him. Well, right. okay, so the the Megden point. Go for it. Do you see? Do you see Elaine in that? Yeah. Oh uh, well, <laughs> the biting. No, I don't. I, I don't. I can't see she Elaine would. biting somebody. But I, I see lots of Elaine in more gaze in other parts. I mentioned it previously in the Path of Daggers when she was pouring some tea and she spilled it and then she cursed to herself. And I thought that's right, like mother, like daughter. She's cursing. She's actually got a foul mouth side, or at least a fascination for it. But as far uh -huh. as the biting, I don't know. I've, have we ever seen Elaine do anything like that? I could see it. I mean, I don't. I don't recall if offhand if, hand, do, if, that she if she does something exactly like that in series. But I could see her doing that. I mean, of you know. the three, I could see. Oh, maybe kind of see Min doing that more. I, I, but yeah, it's no, not see, out, I don't completely see out of her no. character. I don't think. Yeah. Um. Fayil? Uh, but as far as Fayil goes, I like you rob i kind of like her in in these chapters yeah these two chapters that she has um but again you know it's going back to my point about agency with perrin uh Fahil has also been robbed of her agency in this but what makes her a little more likable in these chapters is how she never stops to like really complain or or like get down on herself about it she's scheming like from the get-go she's like i've lost my agency how can i get it back what can i do whereas perrin feels way too passive in his chapters fail is is active even if that activity is just internally yeah she's active you know? she's decisive like that's kind of how I think, why I like her, to, maybe to to fill that void that I think Perrin is is presenting here when he's just being so, pardon the expression, but limp dick about everything. Uh, <laughs> Fayil counters that very nicely. Perhaps that's why I'm enjoying her a lot more than I am Perrin at this point. When it was so completely reversed, for example, in The Shadow Rise. Okay, big question though here. Go ahead. Sorry. So, 
how do you see the point of this whole plot line with her being kidnapped in the grand scheme of things? How vital do you see this? Uh, for anybody listening that's also heard our Path to Daggers episodes, I I just said like I this is something I hope for example that they that they do excise completely from the Wheel of Time show. For example, like I think the Wheel of Time show could do completely without this entire plot line. It would just be a waste. Um, it's really ultimately to me forgettable. It's not completely irredeemable, but it's it is forgettable. And as a result, it could be cut. So I, I'm not a huge fan of it. Okay, what do you think he was trying to do here, both of you? Stall apparently like for what? Free books. Robert Jordan. Just stall? I mean, that's I no. <laughs> I, I think, you know, what I said earlier, he was trying to build Perrin and Fael as foils um, he, with a focus on Perrin's personal character arc. What Perrin needed to learn and needed to do to become the leader the light needs him to be. Uh, Could I he think, do that without this? Yeah, like... I, like, I mean, I... He, yeah, he could have done it without it, but I think he wanted to make a point by having Fayil be a so, counterbalance to him and, my, and showing how Fayil, with fewer resources and less opportunity, by being more assertive and more like active in exercising her agency, almost effectively executes her own escape before Perrin, with an army and with channelers, can rescue her. Because he's dragging his feet so much, and he's spending so much time worrying about everybody else's opinion of him, rather than just taking the reins so, and going about it in an effective manner. You're, so you're arguing that that this is exactly what it taught Perrin. It taught him to stop dragging his feet. Like that's what he took away from this experience. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah. I guess. And we'll get into that more in so uh, Crossroads of Twilight a, and Knife of Dreams. But yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I guess, my main gripe is just how long that it took for him to, to overcome this, I, I suppose. That's really my main my main concern. It's it's going to be for the rest of this book. It's going to be for the rest of Crossroads of Twilight, even though it's... it's, it's so, like, here's, here's again, my, my kind of gripe with, like, the way that's approached, where you're like, it's going to take the rest of this book. There is no rest that's of this true, book that's for true. Perrin. I, but if you're the kind of person, like, for example, I'm sure like, Jared has a huge... Perrin fan was probably going through the second part of this book on his first reread and waiting to get back to Perrin. The fact that we weren't in Perrin's head doesn't really say that we weren't waiting for it, though. Like, it, that when you space it apart so much... Yeah, yeah. Like, it took it, three so months, or three this is where... For this. this is where the criticism of bloat in The Wheel of Time right. really comes in. Right. Because Perrin doesn't have a character arc for this book. Earlier in the series... Robert Jordan was really effective at establishing, like, arcs, multi-book arcs, as well as individual mm -hmm. book arcs for each of his major point-of-view characters. Okay. Yeah. When we get to about here, <laughs> we get to about Winter's Heart, suddenly we lose sight of these intra-book character arcs, and it just becomes all about, like, a three-book arc with Elaine, with Perrin... You know, with Matt, like, it, it's... It, the characters don't overcome conflicts for themselves internally in one book anymore. Rather, it's a, like, two to three book arc from Winter's Heart through Knife of Dreams. I think and that's that where I think the arc. real bloat comes in. And if, if I had to guess, we're going to see a lot of revision for the TV show. I hope, honestly, like I just said. Where they're going to try to turn Winter's Heart through Knife of Dreams into basically one season. I, they could do it. I think they could do it without even having to try yeah. very hard. <laughs> and and maybe if Robert Jordan had, uh, you know, a little more time and less pressure on him, right, right. Uh, he might have been able to step back from the draft of Winter's Heart and been like, okay, I can write a longer book here and fit in everything I need to. Right, I suppose. I mean, it's already pretty long, though. Winter's Heart is not a not one of the. Uh, it books is, in the I series, believe, is the it? second or third shortest uh, shortest in the series. Really? Because my paperback is like one of the thick. I suppose the other we talked about how like there's a whole bunch of factors that go into mm -hmm. that. But, I don't know. Looking at it, it actually looks like a rather large book. That's a uh... no. It's I mean, just going by page count, mm -hmm. 
uh, not including the glossary, this is a 766 page oh, book. Geez, I when you compare that to, uh, yeah, like I, the world's over 800, you know, four, five and six are all like yeah. 980 to a thousand. Yeah. They're, this is one of the shorter books in the series. Yeah. Um, so everything, uh, about Fayil out of the way that we want to mention. Uh, I have one more thing. It's sort of tangential to her. Yes. Oh, tangential. I don't like Roland. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, Roland. And I I just, like, I can, I'm I can't baffled by the love for him in the fandom. I'm not. Like the, I like Roland. You do. Why do you like Roland? Because he could be so much worse. And I know that's not a, a, a glowing <laughs> recommendation for his character. It doesn't mean he's any better, just the fact that he could be worse. But honestly, like, like a lot of other characters i think that we could name in even in this series especially in other series this would have turned out so much worse for fayil like i honestly roland is he kind of offered some loose twisted measure of protection um he wasn't he he, he was he was i guess barely respectful yep yeah. barely <laughs> barely respectful but i i just i don't know he it, it might be a stupid thing to say, but I'm going to stick by it and say that it could have been, that he could have been so much worse. And he did kind of show a little bit of the honor of an Aeol in what he was doing. Despite the fact that he was brotherless, he was Muradin, or whatever, however it's pronounced, right? Like I, I have, see, I have trouble oh, with that because he doesn't show the respect of Guy Shine. Okay, towards Because Gaishine, he's perhaps? so willing to take advantage of Fayil's, like, helpless position. You know, but what do you mean by take take advantage though? Because he's not like he tries to manipulate. No, times. he's not. But he's super passive aggressive about it. Right. He's super okay. manipulative. Agreed. Like Agreed. like he recognizes the the plight she's in, and takes like this sort of creepy long term approach to manipulate her circumstances into getting what he wants, namely sex, out of her. And yeah. And that rubs me like the wrong yeah, way. Yeah, I, 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 do want to reaffirm that I, 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 I don't want to claim that it makes him a good person by any stretch of the of the word. But compared to the Shido around him, and like the we have the nasty characters like Savannah, you know, as far as the Shido go, like he is one of the best we ever see. So I, I don't, yeah, again, relatively not to excuse speaking, him, but he's but, he's not a Shido. Well, he's but, he's with, but he's with the Shido. But he's with the Shido. Yeah, because he's a brotherless. Okay, a whatever. Brotherless. That doesn't make... He's not a Shido. Is it, was he Anyways. not originally a Shido? Do we know what No, no that's what the brotherless Except are, remember? The brotherless are not Shido. Well, yeah, they, they have are... none, but like, where did he... Oh, I guess it doesn't really matter where he originated from. Ooh, does it say? I I think it does. I Yeah, I feel like it does too. I, I don't remember... Right now, Roland. But I was going to say he's not excused... A mirror you know, did not have joined the Shido Aiel. Let's see here. Yeah, no, that's all it says. So it doesn't say what his clan was originally? He no, may he may just tell Fayil, I am brotherless. I am Meradin. Uh, affiliation um, clan, unknown clan, sept, unknown sept, society, Meradin. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, but yeah, it's. Like, I can understand your point there, where, like, relatively speaking, he's better. But at the same time, like, relatively speaking, a Trolloc is better than a Merdral. Right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, no, but oh, you can't compare <laughs> Roland to a Trolloc, though. He's, like, that's unfair, I think. He's... I, so... I'm just saying, like, relatively speaking, a, like, passive passively manipulative right. sexual predator Point is better stance. than an outright rapist like violent rapist but they're still really awful people no no i don't think that was his motive though oh i do what no to get laid oh he absolutely wanted to get in fight i think, it, I think it was honestly but i he, don't think he was gonna manipulate her into that he could have been so much more oh yeah he was i think he was attracted to her and he made that very clear maybe he wanted to lay oh, her, to get her to lay her as we leaf, see i don't know but no, no, he was, he was all, like, as we see in Crosshearts of Twilight and Knife of Dreams, like, he's all about, like, trying to... So, I want to ask this, then. Could this perhaps be colored by Fayil as such a young, what is she, 16, 17 at this point? 
uh, unreliable narrator. Could this be perhaps what Fayil is just interpreting, and perhaps our view is colored by that coming through her lens, perhaps? So, honestly, I think what, we're does, gonna he, what enter... does he do to make it seem like he just wants sex as opposed to trying to roll? Oh, we'll we'll get to that in in Crossroads of Twilight okay. and Life of Dreams. Okay, but but I will say to that point to the unreliable narrator point. Okay, if we're going to interrogate the motivations of other people through that lens, we have to consider what kind of unreliable narrator we're looking at. Whether this is an unreliable narrator in the sense of, do we believe any anything they say or the people around them say? Are they reporting to us unreliable information? Or can we take dialogue at face value, but the narrative and thoughts are filtered through their lens and and in that sense become unreliable like un uh, unbiased so like in the wheel of time i would argue strongly that it is the latter we can trust the dialogue the dialogue happened the way it's reported yeah. but the way characters perceive the actions of others and interpret the actions and dialogue of others will be colored by their perception and their biases and their interpretations. So, but right? that, that's my next question. What does then Roland Fyil. outright say that gives you this impression as opposed to just interpreting... We'll things? get to that in Crossroads of Twilight okay. and Knife of Dreams okay. because that doesn't happen okay. really in I, here. I do love the way you've articulated that, though. I felt like I wanted to be writing that down. Sorry, because Gordon, you said you wanted to... Sorry, go ahead. I'll let you guys... I'll step back. You guys both sound like you wanted to say something. So, so yeah, I, I definitely feel like it's colored by her because as a 16-year-old girl, she's enjoying a little bit of attention and maybe seeing more than he actually means. So I'm not prepared to get into that part of it because all of the really pertinent things about that are not in the section yeah, we just that's read. What he's, yeah, so in Crossroads of Twilight, you Fine. say there's things that he outright says that we can trust more than Fahil's colorful view on the world. Things yes. that he actually Agreed. says, dialogue-wise, that we could use to interpret a more sinister yeah. motive. But for but okay, I will also okay. say, it has been I'll grant you that perhaps. about seven years now since I read Crossroads of Twilight last. Mm. So I'm prepared to change my mind if sure. when I read that in a couple of weeks here, I I don't get the same feeling from it. If, or if I see that Fayil is coloring his actions. But if I remember correctly, there are a few things he outright says that okay. were what I don't remember rubbed me the wrong way. Things, but I also trust that you generally have a better memory for events in the Wheel of Time. So I'm expecting that I'm going to hear something. But if, you're not, if not, hey. But yeah, like, I just like wanted to make that point <laughs> about different types of unreliable narrators. Right. You know, the, you know, this that is definitely good. a style point. Uh, that was definitely because, good because any well-written book is going to have an unreliable narrator from a at least any limited point of view book. If it's well written, will have unreliable narrators to an extent. Okay. But when you get into certain types of books, when you get into uh, books that present themselves as like journals, for instance, the Black Company which is a retrospective, like, recorded journal by one of the main characters. Or The Book of the New Sun, which is a book written by the main character who claims to have a perfect memory and is King recording. Killer or The King Killer Chronicle. Exactly. Over a three -day period and so, yeah. so when you get into a, a narrative like that, that is a completely different kind of unreliable narrator okay. from, say, Matt Coffin. I accept that. I accept that. You know... Good point. To make. And and so there are different there are different approaches you have to take if you're going to try to really you know parse and dig into a book from that perspective. You have to be prepared to analyze it in different ways depending on what sort of narrator we're dealing with. You know, I really was not prepared for this episode, but I'm glad that we managed to land there. On I think we've done over 20 minutes indirectly on Fayil. <laughs> I like that. Oh, right, we're still on Fail, aren't we? We, we uh, are. Is there, is there anything else we have to say to wrap up her character before we move on to others? No, I think that's that's everything I had, Lauren. No, I was thinking Matt Cotha since you just brought him up. 
uh, well, let's keep going uh, chronologically and go to Elaine because okay. we. I think this is going to be a, a big bulk of the episode. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, Rob, kick us off. Okay, so Elaine vexed me a little bit in this part. Um, there were some really, really cool things happening for her, namely like returning to Camelin at last and finally adopting Avienda, as I've, I've mentioned a few times already, bonding Rand with the others. Some parts, though, kind of dragged for me, and I'm referring mostly to the beginning of Chapter 7. I think it was the streets of Camelin, the roads of Camelin. Oh, the street, yeah, 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 the streets of Camelin? Yeah, the cha I, I, and I stopped to write when I was at work. Uh, chapter 7 has to be, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this, has to be one of the most boring chapters in the history of publishing. <laughs> Somewhere in the endless descriptions of everyone around her, these intricate layers of politicking with 40 layers of subtlety, too many, you know, Elaine primly explaining things to those in her retinue and this vast array of concerns that she has that ultimately matter for all, it kind of took a lot out of it for me. And the reason I say that they mattered for all, to use my words, is because think realistically about what happens if Elaine fails to claim the throne. You know, Rand strides in, takes it back. You know... I honestly feel like I've had more engagement out of watching grass grow than out of what uh, than I got out of this particular chapter. So that's how I'm going to start my point with Elaine. But I have more positive to say going forward. I'll let you guys. Uh, yeah. Take the okay. Mic. So so if Rand just takes it back, let me right? just say that changes the whole history of the the entire country. You know, because then it's given away. More than it already has. And we, I mean, he we just have a back, different. Technically. Well, we have a different narrative, with Elaine taking control here, and she makes that pretty clear. She's like, "This is mine. I'm doing this." <laughs> yeah, but she's this taking control of an uncontested throne. Is it really the same thing? Oh man, I wish yes. Lauren had had heard our last episode when we talked about this. Oh shoot. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, like. Rob and I both understand the perspective of, like, why there is this pride in Andor, and especially among the I noble so. women, in the succession of queens. And, but at the same time, it is so, like, Rand never ruled Andor. He never sat in that throne. And if we're going to make that point of, like, the narrative is broken, the narrative has changed, it's already been changed. Ravin sat in that throne. So it doesn't matter. It, it's right. what the common people perceive. And it's the narrative that they go on telling forward and how they see Andor that's more important. And I think Elaine sees that. I suppose you could argue that during the, the reign of Ravin, Morghese was still like just a wall, like, but she was also like, it was hidden that she had disappeared. Like, yes. The people yes. during that entire time still thought that Morghese sat on the throne. She was just being reclusive. They still are operating under the assumption that no man has ever sat upon that throne. And Rand made it very clear publicly that he also was not sitting on that throne. I can, I can see a little bit Elaine's argument there, but I just... I, and I made, made this very clear in the last couple episodes, I'm not sure which one it was, but somewhere in the last two, that Elaine was just making too big of a deal, and especially Dylan. I didn't really, like, I like Dylan for the most part, but she made a, such a huge gamble on the fact that Elaine was just going to, you know, tear down his banners and claim the throne, yeah. not just publicly yep. accept uh, the throne from him. Like, Dylan would have thrown every way based on, or thrown away everything, I should say, based on that little distinction. I don't know. Elaine, I, I feel like she takes that point a little too far. So it kind of... I agree. I lose but, a little bit of patience with her. But I still have more positive to say about her. But hey, go hey, ahead, Drew. Hey, I got, I got something to do moving forward. Yeah, go ahead. Just turn it just turn it up on these chapters to like 1.8 to 2 speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps. But oh, I, I mean, and I might it, miss it's something. It's so much easier. Simple. Oh, it's fine. Just pay attention harder. Also, <laughs> anyway. I'm, I'm working really long work days, so this book has to last me like as long as it possibly can, or else I'm going to be finished my reading for that week by Tuesday afternoon, and I have to go all the way till Sunday to do the episode. Sorry, go ahead. Drew, you said anyway. So, I do disagree with you, Rob, on this okay. particular chapter. Go for it. I thought... I figured you would, from, from a narrative perspective, this chapter was actually kind of genius. Mm. Because what it did was... Uh, twofold. One, it establishes concrete stakes for the succession plotline going forward. We see the plight of the people in Camelin. We see how dire things are getting with 
you know, the, the poor and the hungry in this city. We get news of a military, like a military situation and how much trouble Elaine is in from that perspective. We start hearing about a uh, Nain and Alenia and how we have uh, political enemies of Elaine's who are now AWOL, who are wild cards. We get, um, we get the very clear message that Elaine has somewhere out there a very active and antagonistic political enemy in this succession. It's so easy going from the end of Path of Daggers into this book, assuming, oh, Elaine showed up. She's going to be the queen. Everybody's going to be happy she's back. Everything's going to be good. Here we find out in this chapter, like four or five different things laid down as a foundation for her conflict, her three book conflict. You know, that's going to carry us through. We have stakes established. We have antagonists established. We have a conflict that's starting to build. And we have Elaine who is trying her hardest to get a grasp on it, but struggling. Like, even though you say like, oh, this is the most boring chapter ever, there is so <laughs> much stuff in more or less built words. up in this chapter. Like, uh, I... There are so much descriptions of clothing and so much descriptions of environment and intricate politicking <laughs> and all these little things that it's just like... Yeah. The, some of these dialogue lines are like... 800 words apart. It's like, oh my god, get through the freaking scene already. Well, Sorry. They've, they've got to lay the culture out. You I know, know, part of that this, is well, we, we something already that know ultimately the really doesn't but matter well. because but if she loses, like I said, Rand could just stroll in by himself if he wants and set everything straight. Not that he should, but like ultimately for like the fate of the world, which you're, you've been waiting for in eight books, nine books now, it just kind of feels a little slow. It does. I, I just, I don't know. You Like, Elaine, you know, this, this is a multi-book uh, arc, as you mentioned, as you called it. I just, again, I found it a little slow. I did. I, 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 just, yeah, I find that very interesting. I'm getting more because out of it this than I did probably, as a teenager, but still... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is probably my second favorite Elaine chapter in this book, after A Lily in Winter. Wow. So... <laughs> I thought she had so many... Yeah. I mean, I loved Lily in Winter and like the entire the the bonding. Everything was really awesome. yeah. I, a I love 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 the scene where Rand is like in Nynaeve <laughs> and Land's apartments and he's like under you know the the illusion. Yes, yes, that, yeah, everything about, about that scene is hilarious. And like when Rand professes his love to all three of them, and and Nynaeve's just like having a heart attack, and Land's just like, huh. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's suddenly very very interested in studying the contents of his pipe <laughs> yeah yeah Lance's yeah. like I am I am hmm the one I'm time we ever involved in that. see, <laughs> as far as I know, Alan and Dragon openly shocked as he had in that one moment had pulled his pipe out of his mouth and was just staring at Rand. I mean, great. he's he's got like two or three of those oh, in the series. Oh, it's so good. But... It's so good. And then the whole the whole bonding scene yeah. is excellent for several reasons. Uh, you know, it's a great character moment. It's honestly very sweet. But the uh how do I put it? Like, there's like a vindication on Elaine's part. And this is coming from me, where I, I'm on the record as saying that I liked Elaine and Rand's romance in uh, The Shadow Rising. And this chapter is sort of the culmination of that. You know, it's. We get some thematic elements drawn full circle with Rand's relationships with his three different loves uh elaine is the third and final of them to sleep with rand and she gets pregnant here and since we're on the subject as as obligatory for our character oh, yeah. now on the inking out loud podcast congrats elaine on the sex congrats on the I'll, sex I'll, I'll yep that. <laughs> jeez i i do have a point on that like so separating oh. yourself from the book and and from the situation how do you feel about rand with <laughs> Three different women and sleeping with them premaritably. But much better pre now. That, premaritably. <laughs> <laughs> much better now that Drew has explained the 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 trope of the tripartite goddess. I believe is how you phrased it. Yes. Uh, yes. The. I yeah, feel the, a little better about it mythical. now. I, was, I mean, I, I'm a young man. I never had too much of a problem with it. 
But definitely now, I, like, I mean, I learned that bit from Drew. Yeah, yeah. If, if I'm like looking at this in in a vacuum from my real world perspective, I mean, there's like I I am not on board with that kind of a thing. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but but this is a fantasy book, you know. Like this is this is something that Robert Jordan specifically built on tropes and legends, and it makes sense to me, especially as Rob said, you know, when I went through college and, and learned about like some of the inspiring myths that went into the character development for Rand and Elaine, Avienda and Min, you know, it, it doesn't like bother me on a moral level or anything. And I also want to uh, make very clear that if this no. was like reversed and it was like one woman with three husbands, I also wouldn't give it like this. I, you know, depends yeah, what's done with it, it narratively. It does have an effect on their relationships, obviously, and and he can't put Doesn't his it? all into one. He can't put his all into one of them. You know. With Rand. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I I'm on record yes, in, in our episode so far of saying that like Min gets way more of her uh, uh, attention than Rand should be giving her. Like, well, I think that's just that, because I think Elaine and Avienda deserve a lot more. Far but... lesser dudes, <laughs> like. You know, Avienda is a wise well, one, and Elena is an Aes Sedai and queen. Like, so, I so I it's... will, Go I ahead. will say, in this section, we have two examples of pregnancy, like the bonding, yep. and Elaine getting pregnant, and I, I don't think he quite has the grasp of it. What? Who, Rand? Robert Jordan. Oh, Robert, Robert Jordan. Jordan. All right, I elucidate this point. Sorry. <laughs> he does not quite understand it. He puts, like, she has weird cravings, Elaine does. Oh, you mean with the symptoms of pregnancy. And everybody's oh, protective. how it happens. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is no, exactly well, this how, isn't how it happens. Such, this isn't anything that happens in Winter's Heart. Well, she gets pregnant here. And, and we yes. have the scene of the bonding where they describe yes. being born. Oh, the the twins, the the, oh. or the tw uh, the first sisters. We also uh, have yeah. Melaine, who's pregnant. Yeah, right. Malayne's and she pops in and out. I'm just saying, like, he doesn't quite have have it. I don't yeah, know if I'm willing to to really get on that subject, because so I know like... pregnancy it can vary greatly from woman to woman, and Harriet was very involved in this process. Oh. So yes, but, but he Harriet keeps to the children? stereotypes. He doesn't. Ooh, actually, Harriet exactly. did not have children. Exactly. That's a good point. He keeps to the stereotypes here. He doesn't go all the way through. I can very clearly mm, see. Mm, mm. Actually, I think Harriet did have children. Okay, this okay. is like a totally, totally <laughs> random. Um, I I want to say Harriet had a child from a previous husband. Google. This is random. Google's my friend. Oh, yeah, this is super random, but no, I think I... she was married before Robert Jordan. But yeah, I just wanted to yeah. say it's lacking there. So she bit. was born Harriet it. Stoney Popham, but her name now is Harriet McDougal Rigney. I think she was married twice. Um. Oh my gosh. I don't know where I heard this or how... Yet she married her first husband, Ed, Ed McDougal, in 1964, gave birth to her son in 1968, and left her husband two years later. 68. So her husband would be so, 51? Or her, her child would be 51, her husband. Yes. Gotcha. Uh, so, yeah, so she, she did give birth. She has a son. Right, right. But Robert Jordan didn't experience the pregnancy with her but and Drew I see it lacking. She was editing on yeah, but she, part. Yeah, I, she I gave... see his experience lacking and I don't think she pushed him on it. Okay. I mean I can't I can't speak too much to that. I don't cool. know what the I actual can. process was. Yeah, same. But... I, I don't feel like I should have an opinion on this at all. <laughs> <laughs> so So I will let that stand though if, if uh, let, let it stand that Lauren has spoken. Uh, but, I have... Oh, sorry. But yeah, I, I just find it interesting like how having three relationships really affects his relationship with each of them, and I wish it yeah. could have been more in a lot of ways if he didn't split his affections and time. Like, Avienda is 
has to deal with the whole pregnancy. And let me tell you, like, what a disaster. Elaine. By herself. Elaine. I said Elaine. You said Elaine. Oh, you said Elaine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Elaine has to deal with the whole thing yes. by herself and all these rumors around. And she can't tell anybody that it's Rand. And they think it's... Doyle yeah, Millar. The, the, oh. I'm trying to find a, oh, an yeah. appropriate word there for him. I'm still going He's introduced there here. Okay, you want to start it? Well, no, oh. I, I have a couple more things to talk about Elaine and this chapter in specific. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, I'm going to leave one of them to the lore segment at the end. But uh, when I was talking about how this chapter brings things full circle with Elaine's romance with Rand in The Shadow Rising. Yeah. Okay. I've, uh, you know, I talked at length on our first Shadow Rising episode about how much I love that hard head scene. Yes, you did. When, you know, when Ran and Elaine kiss the first time and there's this, like, awkward, like, tender, adorable. you know, yeah, it's adorable. She keeps and Ran tries to make the flower with the, the feathers and, and, and how can't it do it. And she, like, circle here. she scoops up. And here, the next morning, you know... It, it, also, kind of a hilarious uh, point. Th this goes back to what we talked about with uh, Rain and Avienda, where it's like sometime later, two hours, maybe three. <laughs> yeah. In this one, she says yeah. she remembered her abandoned the night before and most of the day as yeah. well. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed that right away this time around. I was like, oh, okay, there. I mean, reading that as a so, teenager, I was like, sure, and, okay, like and this. Yeah, totally for sure. Mm. This reminds me of. Uh, on Wattmania.com, unfortunately defunct, this was my first Wheel of Time fandom experience, uh, they had a whole humor section. And one of the topics in that was Wheel of Time pickup lines. Oh, and one the... of my all-time favorites was for Rand, a pickup line for <laughs> Rand. It was, I have real staying power. I am he who comes with the dawn. Oh, Christ <laughs> almighty. <laughs> Oh, well, that's it. That's where we end the episode for today. How do I continue from there? Having heard that now and unable to erase it from my memory. Why? Oh, uh, what about the other what the, the other Rand one? Want to see my sword that is not a sword? <laughs> oh. uh. Or, or Lan's. The, Lan had a great one. Duty is heavier than a mountain. And what a pair of mountains you've got. Wow. <laughs> Wow, that's so against oh, what Lane would say, though. Oh, dude, there were some genius. hilarious ones. There was one, it was like for Magedian. It was like, would you like to come into my parlor? Ew. <laughs> and and, Ew. Like, and all the all the Kyrie and Game of Houses ones were like, there's nothing happening in my bedroom. Nope, no need to go in there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I need an adult. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, but but so this scene though, Elaine wakes up the next morning uh -huh. and she turns and looks and uh, on the pillow beside her when she woke lay a golden lily in full bloom, the dew fresh on the lush petals. And that is the flower Rand made out of the feathers he had previously tried to turn into a flower. But, and I love that what, full he circle. he found those feathers? She kept them the whole time, yes. Yeah, but what, what did he just, like, find them in a drawer? He's like, oh, I knew she had these lying around. Uh, I figured he just I, did it again. No, 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 no. It, it, it is definitely the same. The same exact feathers. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So. I and that's so that. sweet. I know, that the thought was, like, so just heartwarming. I was like, oh, okay. That's why I root for these two. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing from that chapter, I, I will save for the, the lore segment okay, at the end, okay, which is, cool. yeah. Um, but I think that leaves us to Matt, right? Yep. Matt. Yep. I just want to say welcome back, Matt. It's good to see we you again. We missed you. Yeah. It was really cool to see where Jordan chose to pick up again on his story, though. Like, immediately following the arrival of Tuan, and after she names herself the fateful daughter of the Nine Moons. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about something that may or may not be, you know, divisive, but here we go. Brace yourselves. I don't like Tuan. And I hate that Matt ended up with her for what appears Why? to be the long run. Why? Okay, so we haven't had much of Tuan yet. But we've got more to come. And the reason I'm saying that, though, is because Eludra. Okay, that's why. It's because of Eludra. Eludra, she's witty. She's sassy. She's not too much so. 
She's clever. She's clearly passionate about her work. She doesn't mind flirting on occasion with a much younger man, even if, you know, by most of her attitude, she kind of thinks that she should know better. That that feels authentic. That feels human. It brings out this whole side of math that I find entertaining to read. And just she, knowing... Sorry, go ahead. She doesn't care about him, though, in that way. What, what makes you think that? Like, she's, she's not she's, interested. She's devastated, eventually. No, she she wants like friends with benefits, and she's all right with that. She it's fun, but she doesn't. That's not her end goal. So I think you both are right here. In Winter's heart, Aludra definitely wants like a friends with benefits relationship. Oh, for sure. But I do think she eventually grows into. Uh, an appreciation for Matt on a very different level. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I, I mean, I'm with you, Rob. Like I like Aludra. Yeah. And I don't, I don't hate Tuan. I don't and hate her so, either. I just don't find but, anything redeeming about her. But I do wish we'd maybe had a little more room to like see a relationship between Matt and Aludra. Yeah. Agreed. Like, cause I, knowing okay. where the pattern is forcing Matt in the future. And yes, I'm going to stubbornly insist on using that term. It forced him in this instance. Because nothing <laughs> about his relationship with Tuan ever feels, to me, authentic or enjoyable. And it what? just breaks my heart Ooh. on the Aludra's razor. behalf. I will back that up. It just breaks my heart on Aludra's behalf, though. Like, Aludra's my girl. Uh, she really got okay. bent by the pattern here, I think. And, see, you know, we see her devastated later. We do. I forget what part of which book it is. But I remember a scene where Aludra is, like, seen crying, like, trying to pretend like she hadn't been because of how this affects her, like Matt's budding relationship with Tuon. And as far as going into why I don't think that relationship with Tuon ever feels like authentic or enjoyable, it's because she just constantly treats him like garbage. All the time. That's what she's been taught to do. But that he's doesn't excuse it at all. She's treating him like he's a dog, constantly. And for some she, reason, Matt just, in, in this one case, finds it not just acceptable, but desirable. I don't understand. She does change. She does change. A very little bit. A very little bit. As, as far as I know, the most she changes is where she finally admits at the end of A Memory of Light. Perhaps I will be willing to admit that it's good to see you. It's no, like, I think that's all her saying things. I don't think it's like, her feelings or their relationship in private at all. A big part of a relationship is saying things. I, I just, uh, Tuan is so cold and so closed and she so has objectifying to in, in everything that she does, the way she treats Matt. It's just, it just feels so stale and I just don't like it. That's her culture. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I totally, I totally agree with that. I just don't think it makes him a good match though. It doesn't justify like... Matt's for some reason how he's so fascinated with that it just feels against his character and I, like, I don't know Matt I feel like could do so much better with somebody who actually appreciates him a lot more like Aludra I think Aludra is a far better match for Matt than Tuan and I just think Tuan's status at the Daughter of the Nine Moons is like somehow more important uh, it just I don't know bums me out on her behalf sorry I'm done oh, ranting <laughs> done I, know, I, I feel like I fall pretty solidly between you two on this point like <laughs> yeah like i i fully understand where both of you are coming from you know and i i just don't have as much of like an extreme opinion on either point but i will definitely say that i wish we could have seen more of like the banter and the mm -hmm. relationship between matt and aludra because it's fun when we get scenes with them and perhaps she's She's witty enough mm -hmm. to engage with Matt on a conversational level like few other characters in the series are. Yeah, And maybe, she has a similar sense of humor to Matt, which just, like, elevates it all. I don't know. I might be taking a, a further step towards Drew and, and ultimately Lauren's uh, uh, stance there in that, like, maybe maybe Tuan wouldn't have been the worst-case scenario. I might have been a little hard on that if, if, if... Aludra had had more of a chance, or perhaps if she even got some closure. But it's just, oh, uh, Matt just up and dropped everything for Tuan, and it, it just, it felt, I felt bad for Aludra. I do kind of like her. I don't think Aludra had room. I think she's all about vengeance, and I don't think she had room for a relationship well, moment. like that. Perhaps the moment. You're, sure, maybe she would have grown, but... I think she did. Where she, where she is right now... No, no way. Uh-uh. She's not available for a relationship. 
not like that. She's she's only available for, you know, little distractions from her vengeance. I don't know. She did give him the riddle about the bell founders. I mean, that was because it's fun, fun and she's witty. It's fun, but yeah, it's also yeah. vital information. I think that she's trusting him with. That's a big step for her. That like she's been very closed mouthed about everything regarding the Illuminators up until this point. Uh huh. Uh, but well, so sort of. I think it's a natural progression for her because she, I mean, she clearly broke ties with the Illuminators when she was kicked out after Rand screwed her whole life up in Kyrian. And then we see her, you know, getting saved by Matt, and she gives him the strikers, and she gives him fireworks. And that is a pretty big step to take not only for an Illuminator, but for her, because those strikers are hers. Those are not Illuminator tech. Those are her tech. You know? And so this... This scene represents the next step in their relationship where she's building trust with Matt and saying, okay, I've already given you the strikers. You want the next big step here? Okay, I'm not just going to give that to you. You need to earn it. Right? Um, I, to close off on Aludra, I just want to say that, you know, I putting aside the fact that I think she would have been a better match for Matt in the long run even, but I'm, I'm still willing to accept that <laughs> Matt and Tuan could have been a, a right thing as long as she had had some closure. I just feel bad for Ludra. That's all. I just feel bad for her. She was witty, entertaining, and I wish that we, you know, that she had at least gotten some closure on that whole Matt thing before he just fell ridiculously over Tuan as a Tavir and two. I don't know. I mean, I okay. like her. I'd give her more screen time. It'd be fun if they gave her more screen time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's everything I have to say about Matt, though. Uh, I think so. Oh, uh, well, I mean, we still have to talk about Noal. Oh, right? yes! Woo! Yes, yes. Because this is not the first time we've seen him, but the first time we've really met him. Hang on, we've seen him previously. Yes. We've seen him twice when and before and this. how? We saw him in the Fires of Heaven in Grandal's Palace, and we saw him in uh, A Crown of Swords outside of... Jakeem Carradine's little uh, mansion yep, in Ebidar. That's when who met? What? Matt. Matt and uh, Noel. They met outside in... of Jakeem's. No, they didn't meet there. They meet here. They talk, though, don't they? No, Matt sees him lounging outside of Jakeem I don't Carradine's remember either mansion. of these encounters. I thought he said You're something. blowing my mind. So okay. there's a scene in the Fires of Heaven when yeah, Grandal and Grandall's Samael. Palace? Yeah, yes. and Samael's like, it's from Samael's point of view. And he's going over... I think it's when they talk about the Shaboan and the Shabote. Yeah, they're talking about the Sharans. Yeah, and and he's looking around and he's like, what is this, like, old, gnarly dude doing in here? He's, like, way out of place. And then uh, and then when Matt is chasing Lady Shiane through Abu Dhar, uh, the White Plumes chapter in A Crown of Swords... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she goes to Jake and Carradine's Paris and Matt has to, like, saunter on by. And he notes that there's, like, a white-haired dude lounging out front. And we have words from Jordan and I, on both of these that those are both J. Uh, Jake and Carradin. Those are both. I almost yeah, Grandall put the compulsion no. on Noal. Grandall put the compulsion on Noal, and sent him to Abu Dhar. Wow. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize he had been compelled. Sent him to oh, Abu yeah, Dhar yeah. for what? This is blowing my mind. Because he she was working with Samael. Damn, dude. Damn. <laughs> These things I'm still finding out years and years later. It's, it's but, crazy. So he, he had probably two different sets of compulsion put on him. He yeah, was definitely God. compelled by a Shamael because he shows up. You know, we get the stories of him, like, showing up in the in Steading Shanghai way back in the day. And he's, like, out of his mind and, like, you know, all of that. Okay, vaguely remember that. That we get from Loyal. Um, yeah, it, it's... No, Jane, well, spoilers. Jane farstrider has been everywhere. <laughs> That's what, I already, already screwed that one up. I made that spoiler already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So, but but getting him like actively engaged with Matt in the scene. This is when he's starting to throw off the compulsion, and he's, you know, he's not acting as a dark friend anymore. He's becoming himself again, and this plays into how like we see him in the next couple books where he's like remembering things and he's struggling to remember things. And uh, I'll bring this up again, and I 
think it's Knife of Dreams. It's one of my favorite uh, excerpts from the Prophecies of the Dragon that Noel, like, he's, like, playing stones with two on or something, and then just out of nowhere, he's like, oh, I remembered it! And he, like, spouts off this prophecy. It, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I like seeing Noel show up here. I mean, anytime we get a Golom attack, tons of fun. Right, yes. and it's, like, with, with Rand's kind of narrative slowing down a little bit and, and Perrin's narrative slowing down a little bit, getting this bit of action from Matt with a Golom attack, perfectly done. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do they have names? The, the Golom? Golom? No. Oh, that's interesting. No. I considered that. Okay, and, I and how... Do we know a whole lot about how they were created we all we know is that agonor, agonor created, created them, them yeah. yeah but, you know, we made but like do we have six any or seven names? or no. maybe there's like 13 but like half are male half are female or something there were six and it was three and three yeah yeah so um but but going on from there i want to say like while yes the tension there uh in that scene with the fight against the golem is like a welcome kind of spike of action that t- tension continues uh, in the following scene when Matt gets back to the palace and he goes to meet with Tuon or, or Tylan and he meets yep. Tuon and the dice stop and Matt's like yep. what the heck yep <laughs> the dice stop something that we've been waiting for a long time for I don't know when these particular dice started but I'm pretty sure it was midway through Path of Dead no it wasn't in Path of Daggers what am I saying it was in Crown of Swords right no they well they stop when he gets hit by the building. <laughs> uh, I start believe again after that. And sure. then they start again where? Are you are you saying the first time the dice stop? Not the first time. Like the, the like when do the dice that stop when he meets uh, I almost said Thailand again. Two on. Two on start. Those dice, when did they start? Because the dice definitely stopped when he had the building dropped on him in building se- or building. I, I mean seven. I don't think we get like a a concrete at least I don't remember a concrete Maybe beginning. Maybe it just picks up and it mentions that the dice had been yeah, rolling. Like, yeah, yeah. Perhaps. I was going to say, because the first time the dice stop is like uh, when he walks into the Wandering Woman, right? Yeah, in book three? No. <laughs> didn't, he have, didn't he have dice in his head when he was doing his whole uh, crazy gambling night in The Dragon Reborn? I guess it's kind of a tangent, though. I but. don't believe so. I think the dice as like the internal dice as a narrative device started in Lord of Chaos and they first stopped when he walked into the wandering woman in Ebu Dar and yeah, met Satal. That's starting Anna. to sound sound more likely to me. Yeah. Uh to our listeners, if if somebody has an a uh, concrete answer on that, let us know on Facebook when we make this post. Uh I might be wrong on that. If you have a you know, an instance right of the dice earlier in in the books, uh, let us know. Yep. Uh, anything but, else Matt related? Uh, not really. Most of the Matt stuff is is going to be discussed next episode because we're we're leaving off right right when things are getting real interesting with him. <laughs> yep. Uh, Should we go on to Rand? Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, I will say that more and more I'm enjoying these brief moments where we where we get to see Rand like honestly forced into humility in a fashion because of his own stubbornness especially. I love it. Like, <laughs> we saw a bit of it before with the maidens and I think it was Lord of Chaos as they like pulled the sheet down over his head and he was like being led around blindly. Um, but seeing him masquerading as newly and trying to adopt like any semblance of modesty was just downright hilarious. Uh, from from the way he forgets himself, like immediately, like by trying to walk alongside Reen Harfer instead of behind her, you know, to the manner in which all of our other yeah. characters are responding to this grotesque face that he's put on. It's just a chapter full of win yes. again and again. <laughs> I, I I was just starting to flip through my book to go back to that scene, and then you brought that up. I yep. loved how he's forced to abandon the Dragon Reborn in Camelin because he's like. Nope, I'm I'm this hyper ugly serving man. Yep, like, I can't <laughs> act normal, and and he's struggling to do it, and everybody's like looking at him askance, and oh, it's so much fun. He's forced to pretend <laughs> humility, and he's so bad at it. I love that uh, idea. Oh uh, yes, I, I love it. Scene? I I really enjoy this scene, yeah. and and it's really funny when, especially when he leaves, and the serving women are like 
What? World? Oh, yeah, when he, like... <laughs> like, why? Like... Well, no, the guards? It was... Guard it's not room. when he leaves. It's when, like, he goes into her apartment. And they shut the door. And then Avienda and Min and Birgitta come out. And the guards women are like, are you, like, what? And, and they're like, no, no, no. no. Don't go in there. <laughs> Don't go in there. And they're like, like the gosh, guards women are looking at each other like, that. no way. You know? <laughs> well, he, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so great. <laughs> Yeah. It's so Oh my great. god, I didn't stop to think that. Like everybody is assuming, of course, that that Doyle <laughs> Millar is a father for children, but these two guards women in particular are probably this whole time for the next few books thinking like, Oh my god, it was probably that really, that's, really ugly ward. That's gonna be one ugly face. baby. <laughs> oh my goodness, those those poor children. Oh, <laughs> I didn't oh, consider that's great. that. You know, it, like to, to balance this whole scene, or maybe just perhaps to, you know to achieve the opposite effect, we get some viewpoints from the Forsaken to balance what's happening here with Rand, as like they discuss what to do uh -huh. about Rand's plan to cleanse Sidin, and like they decide that killing him might be more important than failing. That's intimidating, and I just want yeah. to say what a build up for what's coming. I don't have much, or actually, I really don't have anything else to say about Rand at the moment going forward until we get to part two i will have a lot more in part two <laughs> what a build up for what's coming man oh i can't wait yeah i i agree uh there because Rian really only has a couple of scenes here where um you know he's in kyrian at the academy looking at the new steam engine yep the, the oh, car yeah. that the guy's making <laughs> yes. uh, yeah oh, the, I the it was a train they're, fi they're finally I mean, in the steam age I love yeah. it. It's a train, right? Yeah, it's not on tracks, though. It's a wagon. It's the steam okay. wagon, they call it. But it'll be on yeah. tracks eventually. Um, uh, but yeah, and then he just has these couple of scenes in Camelin. Uh Are we done with characters? Do we want to get into just the very brief I lore? I just going to suggest that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rob, do you have any questions in this sec segment? Um... I, I'm not sure if I heard something correctly or not. I may I may have been falling asleep as I was listening to the audiobook at this point. Are Flynn and Narishma on the list of traitors at the Black Tower? They are. Why are uh, they on the list of traitors? Uh, Mazrum Taim put them on there. Why would uh, he dare to do that? Because he's trying to screw with Rand, basically. Uh, this and Rand was... just doesn't rise to the bait? Yeah, um... Rand is trying to like play such a layered game at this point. He doesn't want Taim to know anything about what he's doing. And at the same time, Taim kind of knows like these two guys are very strong, very talented, very dangerous to what I'm doing. So if I can get any excuse to like, if some of my Ashaman come over them, they have a license to kill, you know, uh, it, it's, it's one of these like really layered games that starts happening in the next couple of books where the lines of communication are getting crossed. People are trying to work at cross purposes, working past each other. Don't quite understand what everybody's going after. Like it, it gets really convoluted, but yes, Flynn and Narishma were included on the traders list. Ah, okay. Okay. So I wasn't hallucinating when I heard that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote down it was cool to consider. Oh, yeah, I just said that. That Rand lands now officially in the Steam Age. Mervyn's Steam Wagon, the Academy, is uh, yep. finally starting to uh, <laughs> get rolling, if you'll pardon the expression I used there. Yeah. Um, I never stopped to consider the irony of the word Maradin for the Aiel Society, brotherless. Because, after all, Kuladin's brother had a name that was very similar. He was Muradin. Yep. Muradin, yep. Right? I don't know if I'm kind of reaching on that one, but it made me pause and think for a second. Uh, I noticed the same thing. Cool. Okay. Okay. I feel better yep. now. Um, oh, I I'll, I stopped to consider that according to Perrin, his force only numbers around two thousand at this point. Like that, by the time he arrives at the field of Marilor, he's rocking a steady seventy thousand people like in his army alone. Like he really picks up momentum after this, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, he only has a like a couple hundred. Was it five or six hundred of the winged guards? And then a few hundred, like six six hundred or so, uh, two rivers yeah. longbowmen. Damn, and then he gets, gonna... and then he gets a contingent, not a huge contingent, but some from uh, Aliandre's uh, Gildanen, mm. you know, yes. army. Um, yeah, yeah, he doesn't have a huge army right now, but he does. I mean, he gets a lot of white cloaks. 
and he picks up a lot of you know a lot more small folk so to speak but yeah. but yeah um we meet finally meet olivia who's a really really cool character um yep. i love that one of the only women we ever see on an order of magnitude above nynaeve came from such an unexpected direction like the shan chan demane i thought that was a great yeah. move on jordan's part like it lets I mean, us this think about flavor like, of chaos, one of, right like go ahead one of my favorite things with olivia is like she's like hundreds of years old yeah, yeah. She's been a Damane in Shanshan. Like, imagine fighting against an army with Olivia on a collar. She has studied destructive Ugh. weaves for hundreds of years with her strength, which is greater than Nynaeve. Yeah, and she's like a, I think a two on the, or a one. I'd she's have to double with, check. With, I think she's a one. I think she's tied with Lanfear. Like her, in her she original may state. be, yeah. Uh, I In fact, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, because Sharina... Um, Sharina Malloy? Yeah. yeah, she is not. I think she's a two. Even though the Aes Sedai are, like, talk about her, like, she may be as strong as it's possible to get. Yeah. I'm like Olivia is a certain. one. Uh, yep. Yeah, Olivia is as strong as possible for a woman. Yeah. Olivia, Lanfear, and Semerage are one. Semerage and then, is, is, is at that same point? Damn. Yep. And then Sindane, Masana, Grandal, Sharina Malloy, and Talon, the Windfinder, are all two. So, so Nynaeve comes in at a solid three, then. And Nynaeve and Karigan Makonar are the only threes listed. Damn. And Karigan was the one of, like, the legendary Amerlins, you know, green Aes Sedai Amerlin raised during the Trolloc Sweet. Wars. She helped, like, end the Trolloc Wars. I love Olivia. Yeah. I'm just gonna say. Yeah? Yes. Like... She has a cool So, she, she can have her own arc, too, because... She was captured at what a 13 14 year old? Yeah, very so young. Yeah, something like that. That's very when young. her in a way maturity stopped. She had to stop. She didn't get to think for herself after that. Yep. So she's coming around to herself as like a 600 year old woman and yeah. finally getting to think for herself and have her own goals and Oh, and she just I, loves I, it. It's really She's cool. So clearly enjoying the ability, to, like just to flex in all directions. You know, that's yeah. Yep. Yep. It's pretty rewarding. And she's it, still timid. She's still really timid, even though well, I, I'm I, sure she's aware. When it comes to the Suldam, she's really that's really true. vicious when it comes to them. But she's she's aware that she's stronger than all of these eyes to die around yeah. her. Yeah. Even if they're more experienced in certain ways. Yeah. I, I it's love... just a cool dynamic. Yeah. I'm so excited to watch her fight the Forsaken coming up. Ah, oh, I'm so good. <laughs> um, Olivia, Olivia. Okay. Um, anything else about Olivia? Uh, no. Uh, I think it's awesome that we briefly learn a little bit about the true power from Demandra's uh -huh. eyes watching uh, Moradin. I thought that was pretty cool. Yep. About how seductive yep. and destructive it is. <clears throat> that was awesome. Uh, pardon me, my throat's pretty dry. I'm gonna take a sip here. So mm. while you're doing that, I'm gonna Go I'm gonna cover the one thing I had in my uh, lore. Oh yeah, kind of segment here. And I'm gonna read a little quote from Bergita. <laughs> okay. Usquai, Bergita mused, oh, rubbing yes. her jaw. I should have remembered. Is that one. anything like brandy? Hmm. I think the girl is blushing. She really is prim most of the time, you know. A joke, you said? Suddenly she grinned and spread her arms expansively. Lead me to this usquai of yours, Avienda. I don't know about you two, but I intend to get drunk enough to, well, to take off my clothes and dance on the table, and not a hair drunker. Min did not understand that at all, or why Avienda stared at Bergita and suddenly began laughing about it being a wonderful joke. This is our clue about what Elaine did in the I, last book with the Red Rod Tarangra. I don't accept that at all. I think it's funny but to, to consider, but I don't think there's anywhere near enough evidence. Just because, I mean, Avienda's probably just trying to brush it off and realizing, oh, okay, this is how I deflect her. Okay, I don't think that's Avienda confirming it in any way. No, that is absolutely Avienda. What, Avienda I, would not laugh at that that way and say sure it's a wonderful would. joke if she's trying to save her what, her what is ayo humor about what is ayo humor about 
But this isn't about humor. This is Avienda trying to save her first sister it's from It's literally a shame. wonderful this joke. This has nothing to do with humor. She's just acting, I think. Just to deflect it. Avienda laughing uproariously is acting. Yes, if it's going to save her no, first sister no. from the shame no. of no. Brigitte running around She doesn't younger. give a shit about... No, that's not at She's all so what Avienda is going after. She's so terrified that is going to go in there and shame her first sister. Of course, I think it's... No. Like, I, no, I don't know. No, you could no, be no, right. No, 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 no. You could be no, no, no. right, but I think you're reaching a little bit. I don't think that's a confirmation. <laughs> I am not at all reaching I don't think that's what Avienda is trying to do. I am not at all reaching here. Hmm. Why? No. This is confirmed? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's actually confirmed. I would yeah, have to I look mean, that up. But this I is this don't. is absolutely what uh, a reference Robert Jordan wrote so in think, to what Elaine did. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's Avienda it's wouldn't over. act. Avienda wouldn't wouldn't stare at her first and be like, <laughs> like she wouldn't act like that and then say it's a wonderful joke. Everything about I yield humor is targeted at embarrassing other people. Right, but this is a situation where she was doing everything in her humanly power to avoid embarrassing Elaine. Yeah, but that's in, that's independent of her saying it's a wonderful joke. Mm, if she were all about that, she would act relieved here. It's possible. Avienda not is not wrong. subtle enough Just to play like off like a joke. Roof. Like Avienda is not a subtle person. No, this is not, there's nothing weird. about this that is subtle. She's just laughing at a joke at Elaine's expense. <laughs> oh, crazy! And is the fact that Birgitta pauses that. when she pauses because she's like trying to. You know, she's, and she has this come into her head and be like, I'm going to make a jab at Elaine. And Avienda starts laughing about it. And she's like, wow, that's hilarious. So, yeah, well, we, that's this, very mean, much what the Red Rod to Rob Real. If there's anything about Elaine's uh, currently standing personality, I will say that backs you up. We, we do know that once she gets drunk, she does have a particularly salacious attitude. We've seen that before. Uh, yes, and although I, think I don't think she got, rising, it's in the Shadow Rising, but I don't think she got drunk. I think she just it acted the like, Griel? yeah, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> that's a that's an interesting Tirangriel, <laughs> especially for somebody like Elaine who has a talent with those and making them. I don't know. Yeah, that that, that, well, that was the experience. Uh, I'm sure, that would have been something anyway. to see. <laughs> that was really my only lore thing on. Uh, oh, I know, actually have one on this lore segment. Thing, believe it or not, I was about oh, to say this all is right. just, just be like a miscellaneous notice here, but this, this kind of loosely works as a lore point. I thought it was really, really, really cool um, when I noticed something in chapter thirteen that I hadn't noticed before. Soralia gives Varen a draft in her tea to help her sleep. Uh huh. She also warns Varen against its potency, claiming that. Too strong yes. of a brew will put you to, to a sleep from which you won't wake. Wow. Yep. I immediately picked up on that when I heard it this time, but it was the first time I, I did pick up on it. And I, I wanted to say, what a masterfully subtle move there. On either Jordan or Sanderson's part, like 10 out of 10. What chilling. Do you mean, how well. Oh, oh. Yeah, well, it it's. That is Robert Jordan. This comes back to play in the next segment of Winter's Heart. Does it as well? Because we like obviously in, in Sanderson's trilogy in in, in uh, the end of Gathering Storm, Varen uses uh, a cup this of sleep. Exact yeah, brew yes. to uh, herself so to sleep. So it is all Robert Jordan. Robert Jordan Robert wrote Jordan? that scene. He wrote that scene in the Gathering Storm. Okay, cool. And as you will see in the next segment of Winter's Heart, look for a scene when uh, Varen is making tea for Cadswain. Okay. Oh, oh no! That sounds like it's going to be dark. <laughs> oh no okay yeah. all right so, all right um, is it in that mansion yeah it's it's in farmatting okay oh okay okay um two more little little points here um not necessarily lore related but i wanted to say really deft move on the part of the shan chan offering to fly tylin around altara like it kind of instills fear uh -huh. but it gives wonder as well but it also shows her how much there is to be gained by accepting their rule subserviently just it's a move that that may or may not have intimidated me a little bit as a teenager like the reminder that the shan chan are to be taken seriously despite their uh couple of minor defeats at rand's hand well you really can't even call that last one a defeat really it was a stalemate they just don't know it oh i would call that a defeat they was lost it a defeat though they yeah. lost but they they, don't they know lost they tens lost. of thousands of soldiers to yeah, rand's that's... like rand only lost like a couple thousand 
it was a strategic defeat for yeah, sure in terms of numbers mm-hmm. but they they yeah they retreated thinking that they, that they got defeated but rand yeah. also had to retreat because he didn't know that he had done that like he just obliterated a huge portion of his own army oh yeah 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 i mean but in terms of like still ratio <laughs> i think they, they had equal losses in terms of percentage in wow. terms of percentage, yeah, no, 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 not even no, close. No, not even close. Rand brought six thousand troops in, right, and lost, lost those, maybe like, he? yeah, like two or three thousand of those. The, the Shan Shan had had like dozens of camps completely wiped out before they brought that army of forty thousand in, and then lost most of those forty thousand as well. God damn, Rand was Rand Commodore. wrecked them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. well, the Ashaman. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and uh, my last miscellaneous point here, I wanted to, to to round off my thoughts for this episode. I want to make sure we stop and acknowledge something that happened in between this episode and recording the last episode, Drew. But the wheel of time just turned thirty. It Cheers did again to Mister Jordan and a drink in his honor. I hope thirty years from now I'm still reading and finding new things. Let me pour a little bit of this. Mm. Right yeah. There. Yeah, that is quite a milestone. Heck yes. That's everything I so, have to talk about for today, honestly. Yeah, uh, I think that takes us into the final draft, right? Anything else uh, that Lauren wants to get out of the way? No, no. We're good? I'm ready. Rob, what cool. are you drinking? I got drunk on Captain Morgan's. Sorry. That's uh. just, that's what happened. <laughs> I, w- <laughs> I just wanted to get that out of the way, like pulling off a Band-Aid. I, uh, I didn't have time this week. It's been a hectic week with doctor's appointments and, and, and going back to work, but... I didn't have time to go to the superstore today. That's sorry, the grocery store. We just called the superstore up here. So I ended up having to, to find whatever <laughs> works around the house. I found some Captain Morgan's. It wasn't the spice this time. It was the white rum. I don't like it as much oh. as the spiced, but it did the job. Yeah. Did I mean, job. I was going to say that looked clear. It and did. also it was... the superstore. What? Sorry, the what? <laughs> the superstore? Yeah, okay. So the grocery store, the bigger grocery store that we have in my hometown is called... Uh, Royal Canadian Superstore. It's like a chain that goes across the whole country. So okay. went, it's like synonymous with grocery <laughs> store. In fact, it's said more often than grocery store up here. Just say you go to the superstore. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's, that's your bit of Canadian trivia for the day. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Lauren and I are drinking the same thing. Oh, yep. yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a big bottle. So it is an Imperial Stout from Adroit Theory. Adroit Theory. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is in Virginia. Adroit Theory Brewing Company. Um, this is an Imperial Stout, 13.5%. <whistles> brewed with Mostra coffee, toasted coconut, toasted marshmallow, and Saigon cinnamon. Uh, oh Lauren, my god. Talk to me about what you think about this Oh beer. my god, uh, that sounds like nectar this, in a cup. This is nicely full-bodied. And, I mean, ours have warmed up, so very sweet, but balanced. I definitely get that coffee flavor. Oh, nice and roasty. I'm such it's, a sucker for it's coconut. It's really good. I am such a sucker for coconut. You add some coffee yeah. and some marshmallow in there, and I'm, oh my goodness. 13.5%. Oh, yeah, you would have loved what we had last night. It was uh, Campfire Stout. Yeah, some more so, stuff. Like a so oh my much goodness. marshmallow. All marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my goodness. But yeah, for me, I am getting a lot of marshmallow and a lot of coconut out of this. Oh, God, it but sounds so good. But as you said, Lauren, it is pretty balanced. Like, a lot of the time, in my experience, cinnamon stouts, like, the cinnamon can really just take over and dominate. I don't like that. Um, but yeah. that is not the case here. It, The cinnamon's present, but it's not overwhelming um it it is very thick i mean it 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 pours pours thick and you know this this beer has been sitting in our refrigerator for a few months now and like when i poured this there uh like little chunks like the lipids are even starting to come out of solution because there's just so much like wow yeah it it was this is an extravagant beer you got to show them the label. Yeah. Look at the size well, of the I bottle. haven't said the name yet. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't ruin it. Uh, Come on now. But anyway, this I beer be is my now. ode to uh, what I uh, mentioned early on about all of these disparate elements of the shadow working behind the scenes. And it is called What Evil Lurks. 
Oh, I like it. It's koi. Yeah, but look at this. Lurks. Look at this label. Oh, yeah. it's damn. It's dark. It's hard to see, but it looks like. Is that a? Skull? It's like a skull. Yeah, what with, is that? it's like a like a demon skull with like cobwebs so, on it and stuff. It looks so metal. I like it. Yes. Very yes. metal. It looks like something that would be on the cover of a Black Company book. Yeah, oh. yeah, I can see that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Nice. I will say though, there. So on the label here, uh, there's a little description, but it's more of like a I don't know. Uh, I don't. Know, I'll just read it. It says, "Slinking in the shadows of our barely acknowledged selves, there lives an elusive suggestion so complex yet so exquisitely simple as to create a soul-stealing madness in any who look too closely, seek too keenly." Skulking about, awaiting the precise moment to ride up and be known. To peel flesh from bone so our flaws are exposed and we are set free. Madness comes with a price. So I, I stand by what I said before. It's, it's a very metal beer, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that said, in a bottle. I have real problems with this because uh -oh. there's so many like grammar errors in this. Uh, so they definitely mean they metal. say yeah, elusive with an I, but they definitely mean elusive with an E. With an E. <laughs> and then they have this line: a soul stealing madness in any who look too closely seek too keenly. Look too closely is the two is spelled T O O, and seek too keenly is spelled T O. Uh -oh. oh, so they're even uh, using the same context, but they're spelled different. Spell and, check and messing up the twos, yeah. So, I I can't give this full marks because of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's terrible. It could be the most delicious beer in the world, and I still wouldn't go higher than four uh, out of five. Yeah, I have to, I have to take issue there. Damn. But uh, <laughs> but the beer is delicious. I it's mean, quite good. That's I'm not pretty the brewer's happy with fault. It. That's the editor's fault. The marketing, the yeah, also marketing department for sure, and know how to speak basic sixth grade mm. English. Oh yeah, but he probably uh, didn't write that. Yeah, the I know, but he probably would that. notice it. She, if he, knew he or she, how to speak the damn language. Mm -hmm. Not so. I don't mean if it's actually somebody who doesn't speak the language. I just mean. Like, I I would say I'm. I'd be surprised if the brewer actually saw that copy. Yep. Wow. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna speak from working at a brewery. He did not see that copy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> imagine imagine finding that out. This is your beer. You're looking at it, and it's oh my goodness. Somebody's gonna yeah. get fired today. <laughs> I oh, mean, man. we had one. Um, it's called Serious Black. Oh, yes. Harry Potter. Oh. Yes, that serious. And it's 6.66%. Yes, and uh, the brewer oh. actually did write the front for it, where he was like it was caged in a dark, dark dungeon for six months. And I was like, yes. Okay, okay. Kudos yes. for, for trying there. So Points. proud of him. He had, I, I mean, I'm not doing it justice. He had a whole front for it, but. Nice. <laughs> well, uh, on, on that note, though, I think we're about at the end. Yep. This has been episode 52 of the Inking Out Loud podcast. So. And uh, next up, we are. A little bit up in the air because we have a crazy schedule coming up. It is either going to be Winter's Heart Part 2 where we'll finish the book or uh, it's going to be Solo Command by Aaron Alston, uh, the conclusion to the Race Squadron books that Lauren and I have been reading. Uh, depending on our schedules uh, over the next week because there's, there's some craziness coming up. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash inkingoutloud. You know, if you support us there, that helps us pay for the services of our sound engineer and artist, as well as hosting our website and the, uh, you know, the episodes themselves. We've got a bunch of great, uh, you know, great bonuses that you can get access to there, including some monthly short episodes and starting this year, uh, monthly short fiction. We just posted our first uh, short story, one that I wrote. I think next month it's going to be a Rob uh, yeah. selection. So, yeah, check that out. As always, I'm your host, Drew McCaffrey. With me is my co-host, Rob Santos. Hey, everybody. And our special guest, Lauren McCaffrey. Thanks for having me. So, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>